Deep within our souls, the ache of insecurity resides. Am I good enough? Am I strong enough? Am I worthy of love? Real love. Not the love that is dependent on my performance, but love that lifts me to new heights and leads me to achieving things I never dreamed possible. A love that quickens my heart and leads me to my knees. What love is this? Welcome to Pastor Jim Scudder's series, Am I Loved? Love is such a mystery, isn't it? Sometimes we need help with love, don't we? Here's some tips for you women. Never laugh at your husband's attempts at poetry. Roses are red, violets are blue, some poems rhyme, this one doesn't. <laughs> Roses are red, here's something new, violets are violet, they're not blue. Roses are red, violets are blue, but I wouldn't know because you've never brought me flowers. <laughs> now, women, don't laugh at your husband's attempts at poetry, but men, don't ever laugh at your wife's choices. It's so tempting, but don't. Why? Because you're one of them. <laughs> In this series, we're not talking about the love in marriage, although if you understand the love of God, you're gonna have a much better marriage. This is not a series about loving your children, loving your neighbors, but if you understand God's love, you're gonna be really good, or at least a lot better at that. This is a series to ask the question, am I loved? And I know the real yearning that everyone has, everyone in this room, everyone watching today, does God love me? Does God love me? Am I loved by God? And if so, how much does he love me? And, and what is God's love like? And, 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 and will God's love affect me loving other people? That's what we're talking about in this series. We're finishing it today. The Bible has told us very clearly, not just that God loves, but God is love. God is love. That's, and by the way, if people are, are asking me the question, what is God lo like? I'm gonna talk about how he is pure, he's holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's omnipotent, uh, he, he knows everything, he's all powerful. Uh, I, I, there's all these attributes, but I think the chief attribute of God is, God is love. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care about the way you live, for he sure does, but he cares about the way you live because it affects you. He loves you, so he wants you to live in a certain way, the way that he has designed it so that you can love other people like he loves you. This is such an important topic. Am I loved? Yes, you're loved. God is love, and God so loved the world. I'm telling you, I can never get tired of that verse. God so loved the world. Every time we have a service, every time we do a TV or radio show, we talk about God loving the world. If God is love and God loved the world, and I'm in the world, do the math. That means God loves me, All right? For sure, and I can say that to anyone. I don't care what your background is, I don't care what your accent is, I don't care what food you like or don't like. By the way, uh, there's gonna be a chili cook-off after service today. I have entered the competition. I'm just saying, these are impartial judges, they're all on my staff. <laughs> if they like their job, vote for the chunky chili with poblano and a secret spice that I'm not gonna tell you what it is. But if you can come tell me what my secret spice is, I'll give you a free bowl of chili. <laughs> Where was I going with all that? I have no idea. All I know is God loves you. 
Jesus died for you, then why do bad things happen to me? A couple of you have gone through really, really hard times the last few days, the last few weeks. A couple of you have lost a child or a grandchild, a daughter. Some of you are facing sickness, cancer, disease. Some of you have a terrible situation at home, a terrible situation in your marriage. So how, if God is good and God is love and God loves me, how, why are these things happening? Why are these things part of my life? And that's a real question and we can't duck that question. And I'm not gonna duck it. I'm not gonna answer it, but I'm not gonna duck it. Here's all I know. I don't know why God allows certain things to happen, but I know that he allows certain things to happen for my good. And it's hard to imagine how these things can be good. It's really hard to imagine. But if God is love and God loved the world, that means God loves me. That means that he's going to allow certain things in my life that I don't understand right now but I will one day, and I'm just gonna keep loving him and serving him and trusting that he cares about me and that he wants the best for me. That's what we're gonna get to today. We love him, 1 John 4, 19, because he first loved us. I mean, this is incredible that God first loved us. God knew what would happen when he created us. He knew we would sin. You say, well, why did he? If he knew all this mess in the world and all the terrible things that have happened would happen before he created us, why did he create us? All I can say to that is, I'm glad he did because I have breath and I'm here and I can worship him and I can glorify him with my life. And if he did have said, well, forget it, this is gonna be a mess, I'm just not gonna do it, then you wouldn't have existed either. These are big questions, these are hard answers, but I'm glad he did. And by the way, he wasn't rolling the dice saying, well, if I create them and, they, and if I give them free will, they'll, they'll, some of them will choose to not love me or some of them choose to love me and I'm just gonna take a gamble on this. No, it said before the foundation of the world, he had put in this plan of redemption. Why did he do it? So he could showcase his goodness and his love. So what we're trying to do in this series is showcase God's love. Even when it feels like we're not loved, he loves us. We love him because he first loved us. So what we're gonna do today is go through Romans 5. We're gonna go through the first nine verses. I'm gonna talk fast. I need you to listen fast. Can you all do that today? That means you have to stay awake, okay? You have all, you have like eight hours every night to sleep. So come to church, you're all refreshed, and here we go. Okay, you all ready? Romans 5, verse one. Therefore, being justified by faith. What is justified? That is be made righteous. We are sinners. In order to be saved, we have to be made righteous. We can't make ourselves righteous. Jesus died. He was righteous in our place. He poured out his blood for our sins. And if you receive him through faith, you're justified. Made righteous. When God looks at me now, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees Jesus' righteousness because I received him by faith. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Oh, that's the greatest thing in the whole world. By the way, that will help you sleep, not in church, but at night. Peace with God? I know for sure that he loves me, he cared about me, he, Jesus died for me, the son of God, and, and that gives me peace, and I can sleep knowing that if I die in my sleep, I'm, I'm not uncertain if I'm going to heaven or hell, but I'm going to heaven not because I'm good, but because he was perfect and I put my trust in him. There's just a wonderful peace about that. Everyone's longing for peace. The world is longing for peace. Nations are seeking peace, but they're not finding it. Why? Because they're not looking in the right place. The only way that we're gonna ever have peace in our own lives, peace is, is when we have peace with God. How do we get peace with God? You need to be justified by faith. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse two, by whom also we have access by faith. Now, we're starting to lay out all the things. Now, we know that salvation is what, the, the, one of the greatest things about salvation is that we have heaven to look forward to, but don't forget all the other things that we get with salvation. Peace with God, 
access by faith into his grace wherein we stand. Some people think, well, I have to receive by faith eternal life, but now I have to work to stay saved, or I have to work to please the Lord. And actually, he wants you to work, but he wants you to work through his power and his empowerment. And you're saved, and you have eternal life, so you don't have to keep worrying about, am I going to stay saved? If, and, and some people say, well, Pastor Scudder, let's say I, I receive the gift of eternal life by faith, and then tomorrow I sin. What happens? Well, let me tell you something. Tomorrow, you will sin. You have eternal life. When you receive by faith the Lord Jesus, we're in his hand. You say, well, what if I fail? You will. He still has you. He's got you in his hand, and no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. There's a wonderful security in that, and that's where that peace with God comes back to play. We have access by faith into his grace, and it's, it's something that we don't have to worry about anymore. The Golden Gate Bridge was built. A tremendous feat of engineering, architecture, and actually building. I mean, this was way back. And it, was, it spans a mile, and they, they, they wrapped these huge cables one by one. They were a tenth of an inch each. The cables on the Golden Gate Bridge would stretch around the earth at the equator three times. This is incredible that this all happened a long time ago. But there was a lot of workplace accidents. They said every million dollars you spend on a project, one person would die back then. So I think they spent like 50 million on the bridge, and so that would have meant 50 people died. They did have some deaths, but the, the person that was building it said, you know what, instead of them worrying, if they fall off the bridge to their death, they're not gonna work as efficiently, they're gonna be worried, they're gonna be scared. So he spent, I think, $125,000 on a big safety net underneath there. So if they fell, the safety net would catch them. They said work really improved once they knew that they could work without worrying about falling and dying. And I think that's a perfect illustration of what God's grace is. We stand in that grace. It's not to say we should fail him, we should fall, but if you do, he has you. And there's a wonderful security in knowing that. And you can rejoice, look at verse two again, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hope is a wonderful thing. It's, it's not just a, uh, I hope so, I, I, I'm, wish, I'm wishful, but it's a confident expectation. We know that God will preserve us in the glory of God. Verse three, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. You say, wait a second, Pastor Scudder. Stop, don't continue. Glory in tribulations. This word tribulations had, had an idea of a, a wooden beam that had spikes, tribulum it was called in, in the, the, the Greek world. And it was a beam with all these spikes that would be dragged over grain and it would separate wheat from chaff. And in here we're told that tribulation is something that God can use to make us better. It doesn't seem that way. When you take your child to get a shot when they're little, they're, they don't think you're being kind to them. They don't think you're being good to them. They think you're hurting them, but you're really bringing them to get that vaccination so that it'll save them from a lot of pain or death later on in life. They don't understand that but it's still true, you love them enough to do this for them. They feel pain, that's all they know, right? So sometimes God is gonna allow that tribulation in your life in order to make you better, to make you more like him. But the problem is we're in the middle of it, and it hurts, and we're emotional, and, and we stop remembering these truths about God. And we, we sometimes have to be reminded, and maybe that's why you're here today, is to be reminded of how much God cares about you, even if you're going through a really hard time today. We glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. There's a story of Polycarp in the city of Smyrna. Years and years ago, this was in the early church, Polycarp was an elderly man. He was a, a leader in Christianity. He was a godly man. He knew uh, the apostles, and the uh, Roman Empire was ratcheting up persecution, and they decided to take out Polycarp, and if they can take out Polycarp, maybe they can stop Christianity. 
So they sent the soldiers to go arrest him and they got to an old farmhouse and instead of Polycarp hiding in fear, he invited them in. He invited them to have a meal. He asked if they could give him a little bit of time for prayer. And as he knelt there and he was praying, the soldiers that came to arrest him were hearing this godly man in his prayers. And they started to wonder, what are we doing here? Why are we here to arrest this man? He's no threat. There's no problem here. But he was willing to be arrested and they took him and they were bringing him before the Roman proconsul and they gave him an opportunity to recant Jesus Christ and be freed. If he didn't, he would be burned at the stake. And he said these famous words, 80 and six years have I served him and never did he me injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Well, that was blasphemy according to Rome. And they did light him on fire. And he did burn alive, a death I can't even imagine, a tribulation I can't even imagine, a trial I can't even imagine. And they said, though, those who were watching, that his face reflected the joy of God. Even in his death, he was a testimony to God's grace. And you say, there's no way that if God is good, he would allow that. Well, he may. And you might not understand it today, but I promise you one thing, you will understand it one day. We sing the song, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. You know, the, the next thing he saw as he was burning at the stake, instantly he saw the Lord Jesus. A moment of pain and then an etern eternity of joy. Remember that when you're going through a trial. Remember that we can actually glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Look at verse four. And patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame, because, here it is, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. If God is love, and those that have received by faith God's love through Jesus, you have the Spirit of God living in you, therefore you have experienced God's love. And that should change you. Every day that you yield to him, it should change you and make you more like him. And if he is love, he will make you love in a profound way, in an amazing way, in a way that will be a testimony to his love. So this is really what I wanted to get to today, these next few verses, and uh, we want to zoom right in on Romans 5, 6 through 8. These are powerful, these are important, these are verses that all of us need to come back to again and again, but some of you have never heard this, so you pay special attention to what we're about to read. For when we were yet without strength, basically that describes everyone that is still lost, everyone that is without eternal life, everyone that is still in sin, still in their sins, without strength. In due time, Christ, that word Christ is the same as Messiah, the one that was promised, and he came, it's Jesus, died for the ungodly. Some, some people think I'm pretty good. I'm okay. I'm better than my neighbor. Look at the person next to you. I'm better than that person. Oh, don't do that. But that's really what we think. We're, we're, we're better. Th I mean, I, we haven't committed murder. You know, I ho hope you haven't. But Jesus said, if you've had hatred in your heart, you committed murder. So really, we have. Christ died for the ungodly. We were without strength. Now, this is... This is uh, really what I want to get to. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. In other words, it's rare, but it's within the realm of possibility that one person may give their life for another person if that's a good person. Right? Let's imagine this, and you've heard me use this many times. There's a train coming down the middle aisle of the auditorium. The train is coming and it's going fast and it cannot stop. There's a switch right here where the 
aisle becomes the front row. And the switch, the train goes one way and the other way. And the train is coming, and the switch is right here, and I can control the switch. And the train can go this way or this way, but we have a problem on the tracks. Over here, we have a criminal. This person is a bad dude. This person has committed murder, has been convicted, is sentenced to die, and he's stuck on the tracks. And over here, there's a doctor. The doctor has just made an amazing discovery. His discovery is that he's found a cure for cancer. He has not yet published, so if he dies, so will his cure die with him. And millions of people will not receive the help that they could have had if he dies. The train is coming, and I'm standing at the switch. What am I going to do? We, that's what we would probably do. The train is coming, and we would say, okay, he's already condemned. He's a murderer. I want to save this good doctor. Nobody is probably going to allow a good person to die for a bad person. Let's go back to the verse. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, or perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. So now let's change this up a little bit. We have, instead of a convicted criminal, that's you. Right here, that's you, stuck on that track. You say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a criminal, but we all are sinners. And over here, instead of a good doctor, we have the Son of God. Now the train is coming, and you're at the switch. What's going to happen? Are you going to allow this good person to die for you? Well, that's what God did. Jesus is the good person. He is the perfect person. He is the great physician. The train is coming, and God the Father is at the switch, and he loves you so much that he allowed his son to die in your place as the train came, he said, I love you, so I'm going to allow my son to die in your place. Okay, now let's go back to verse 8. But God commendeth, that means to demonstrate. God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see that? Now, why is that important? Because until we can visually understand what's happened here, we will never fully appreciate how much God loves you. And how does this impact my life? How does this impact understanding that God loves me and even if I'm going through really hard times? Well, if he would do this for you, that's the greatest example of love the world has ever known. There can't be a greater story of love than this love story. This is the main story of the scripture. God has demonstrated his love toward you by allowing his son to die on a cross for you and for your sins. And by faith in him, you shall have eternal life because Jesus rose again from the dead. And if you'll place your faith in him, you'll have eternal life and you'll be saved for all eternity. That proves how much God loves you because he did, he did something that is incredible. And that also means that if I'm going through a hard time and I've accepted salvation by accepting Jesus, I have eternal life at the end. The worst thing that can happen is I would die and go to heaven. You know what? That's going to get you through this trial that you're going through. Saying, thank you, Lord. I don't understand it. I probably won't understand it until I get to heaven, but I'm so grateful that you demonstrated, you did, you, you did what, what is unthinkable. You allowed your son to die for a sinner. You allowed your son to die for me. And it's still gonna be hard, but if you really get that, the trial that you're gonna go through is gonna actually make you more and more like Jesus, who loves you and died for you. 
Verse 9 of Romans 5, much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Isn't that awesome? There's no hellfire awaiting you. Justified by his blood, saved from wrath. That is the story of love. That is the main theme of love in the scripture. We'll end with this verse, 1 John 4, 10. Here in his love, okay, you wanna know love? Here it is, here it is. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That's a complicated word that you've probably never used before. It just means um, the, the top of the Ark of the Covenant was a, a lid, it's called a mercy seat, and that's where the blood of atonement was poured once a year for Israel. That's a propitiation, it's a mercy seat. It, it's what Jesus did, a one-time payment it was a propitiation for our sins. We translate this message into Spanish and Russian. And I'm not sure how you all are translating propitiation. And that's a hard thing, and I appreciate the people that do that. And they put the verses now in two languages. If you get, or three, I guess, with English. If you get the wrong one and you don't have your glasses, you're not going to be sure what's going on. But I'm so thankful for people that do that extra work and translate these verses. But it's a, it's a wonderful picture of the, what Jesus did. He mercy seated for us. He was that one and final payment for our sins. He didn't just cover sin, but he took away sin. The final sacrifice of the Lamb of God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is love. I told you about Philip Bliss last week. He was a famous Christian songwriter in the 1800s. He was a singer, he was a composer. He only lived a few years into his full-time Christian ministry. So it's amazing that he wrote as many hymns as he did, and there's a lot of popular hymns that he wrote. One is, what we sang last Sunday, I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. He was singing songs, others were singing songs about us loving Jesus, and that's fine, but it's hard for us to love properly, so let's sing about him loving us, which is perfect love. That was a great thought, and he wrote that song. Hallelujah, what a savior. Just incredible. For only a couple years, the, the songs that he wrote were, were magnificent, but the one of the greatest songs he wrote, in my opinion, was a song that he wrote as his last song. He didn't know it was his last song. It turned out to be his last song, and I believe it was also the first song, or among the first songs, hymns, to be ever recorded on a phonograph. Philip Bliss and his wife were in Pennsylvania for Christmas. They had their young sons with the uh, grandparents. And they were called back by D.L. Moody to come back to Chicago to have a conference. And he was leading the singing at the conference. And he was singing at the conference. And so they got on a train and they started heading toward Chicago. And the train was the Pacific Express. It was snowing heavily on December 29th, 1876. The train was approaching a town in Ohio when it was passing over a new trestle bridge, but the bridge wasn't built properly. And as the engine, there were two engines struggling against the snow to get across, the, the first engine got across as the trestle bridge collapsed. And these were all wooden train cars and they were being kept warm by pot-bellied stoves inside the train cars. And all the train cars fell 75 feet into a ravine with a river. And they all crashed down. Eyewitnesses said that they saw Philip Bliss crawling out one of the windows of the car. Within minutes, all the cars were on fire because of the stoves that were in them. And they were wooden cars and they were on fire. And he realized that his wife was still inside. So he climbed back in. Somebody told him not to and he said, well, if I can't save her, I'm going to die with her. 
and he did. They never found and were able to identify the remains. And after only two years of ministry, both Philip and his wife died in that horrible, tragic train accident. Why would God do that? Why would God allow that? We don't know. We might not know until heaven. You ever seen the back of an oriental rug? The, the front is beautiful, but the back isn't. Because it wasn't designed to look at from the back, it was designed to look at from the front. And on the back, you're gonna see threads hanging and it's not gonna have the, the pattern or the sheen, but on the front, it is incredible, it's beautiful. And I believe that you're gonna look at your life one day from the front side, it might not be till heaven, and then you're gonna see the tapestry that God was doing. It doesn't make sense from the back side, but from the front side, you're gonna say, okay, now it makes sense. Well, here's what I want you to do. While you're still on the back side, I want you to start remembering what it's gonna look like when God is done. And accept what he's doing in your life, no matter how hard it is, don't forget how much he loves you. He demonstrated his love by sending his son to be a sacrifice for your sin, to be a propitiation, a mercy seat, an atoning sacrifice for you. And then one day we're gonna say, wow, he knew what he was doing. He is the master craftsman. Let him do his work, trust him. Trust him. Be a testimony in your trial of what God has done and is doing for you. So what's the rest of the story? Well, a few days later, somehow, the trunk arrived in Chicago from Philip. In his trunk that somehow survived the accident was found some poems. He had been working on his next songs. And someone took a song that Philip Bliss had written, basically his last song, and put it to music. And that song is a song about his Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love for me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt, and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love for me. He from death to life has bought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, O oh sing, of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. The last song of Philip Bliss in his short life, and that song has been sung probably many times by you without you even knowing the story, the tragedy. But out of tragedy comes beauty. Out of tragedy comes a song about redemption and love and Jesus pouring out his blood because he loves me. So I don't have all the answers today, but I know one thing for sure, God loves you. Am I loved? Say amen if you're loved. Amen. amen. Do you know Jesus? Have you received it? We love to show an illustration. I showed this in San Francisco to those that came to gather in grace. I loved using this illustration. This is you and me and this is sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't get rid of this sin. We're damned with our sin. We're going to spend eternity in a place that he created for the devil and the demons, and that's hell, and it's eternal, and it's real. It's a lake of fire. Even if you say, I don't believe in hell, you know it's real. God has created you with an innate knowledge that there is a hell. That is the destination of all that have sinned. And you say, Pastor Scudder, you can't get rid of your sin yourself? Yes, so what are we gonna do? Well, we are without hope. We are impoverished, we're without strength, right? Aren't you glad that God loves you? Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us that we might be made, watch, the righteousness of God in him. 
You say, well, that's, that's pretty amazing that, that Jesus paid my sin. He was the propitiation. He was the mercy seat. He was the final atoning sacrifice by his blood for my sin. And you're saying if I just receive that, I have eternal life? Yes. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. We already said, uh, John 3, 16. Let's go over it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus. By the way, this is him speaking. This is, this is, these are the words of Jesus. That whosoever, what does it say? Believeth, believeth in him. What does believe mean? It just means to trust, to depend on him. Shall not perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life, which is heaven. It's a simple, simple message of hope, of salvation. And once you've believed, you have received, you are saved and sealed into the day of redemption, he has you in his hand. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a, what? Gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. You say, Pastor Scudder, I've never heard that. I've been in churches, I've been studying religions, uh, and I've never heard about a God who loved me enough to die for me, and I've never heard about a God that rose from the dead. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead. The tomb is empty, the tomb of Jesus. He's alive. So that proves who is the true God. Jesus, the Son of God, died in your place and rose again. And if you'll simply trust in him, it says have faith, not in works, not in yourself, but faith in Jesus that he died for you, you have eternal life. And I pray that today, if you've never received that gift, you would do it right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want this private time between you and God Do you ever remember a time when you've received eternal life? Do it today with your heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't want anyone to be embarrassed right now. I want this to be a private moment just between you and God. Today, maybe for the first time, you've you've understood the truth of salvation, the truth of the sacrifice that God has made for you that proved his love for you. We've said this before. If you were the only one alive, Jesus would have died. For you. And I believe that to be 100% true. Have you ever received that? Have you ever believed in Him as your only hope? Do it right now. Say like, something like this in silent prayer I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I cannot do anything about it. Therefore, I put my trust in Jesus, who paid for my sins on a cross by His death, by His resurrection. I have faith in Him right now. Thank you for giving me everlasting life. Can I pray for you if you've made that decision today? Hold up your hand. Hold it up for a moment so I can pray for you. I won't embarrass anybody today, but I want to pray for you and rejoice with you in your salvation today. Hold it up for just a moment. Say, Pastor Scudder, today I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. I've seen many hands. Are there others today? This is something you do one time, and I see others You put your trust in Jesus one time and you have eternal life and you're doing that today. Can I pray for you? I've seen five so far. Any others today? You don't have to raise your hand to be saved, but I really believe it's a a good thing to do so that you can have strength in your walk with the Lord. Lord, how grateful and thankful we are today for eternal life, for salvation, for love. We thank you for how much you've loved us. Lord, now help us to learn more about your love, to walk in your love, to love other people because we now have the Spirit of God. We have love itself in us. Change us every day to be more like Jesus. Help us to yield to the Spirit's power and help us to love, especially those that aren't lovely. None of us deserve your love. Therefore, let us love other people that don't deserve our love. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.